Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Horse Center tonight. After a little bit of technical difficulties getting connected, <laughs> uh, we're joined this evening by retired jockey and now uh, a uh, fitness phenom, Rosemary Homeister Jr. How are you, Rosemary? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Doing pretty good, thank you. Now, the junior, for those who don't know, comes because you were and your mom shared the same name and you were both riding at the same time. Is that true? No, my mom was training horses. And mm. I when I started racing, she was training. And when I started, people thought she was training and riding for other trainers. So it oh. looked like a conflict of interest. I see. So then you just you just added the junior. It's not really on the birth certificate, correct? Exactly. Yeah. All right. And then how many times have you been asked about that? Too many to count? Oh, yeah. But you know what? One thing, that junior to this day, you're still talking about it. Mm. So it kind of it kind of gave my career a little boost. <laughs> it was something different. You know, your career didn't need much of a boost. You came out of the uh, gate, so to speak, <laughs> flying hot because... You uh you won a lot of money your first year. Tell us a little bit about how you had so much success so early. Um, I well, I have to give a lot of credit to my mom. She really put a lot of work into um getting me ready to ride, losing weight, um, teaching me how to learn from the ground up by breaking uh yearlings on the farm, going to the track for two years, uh learning with the yearlings or the two year olds. Um, coming to the track, you know, learning my hands. Um, the the biggest thing I think was losing the weight. Not that mm -hmm. I was heavy, but for racing, yes, I was heavy. So getting down to 100 pounds um, prior to riding my first race was, it was a challenge, you know. Um, but once I got there and once you start racing, I mean, the weight just stays off and you just start building muscle. Um, but I was very fortunate because I had a really good agent at that time. His name was Richard Ancona. I had my mother was a trainer. My stepdad, Larry Lyons, was a trainer. So I had um, horses and, you know, trainers, obviously, and owners going in on my side. That was good. And then you ended up in kind of a zigzaggy route, ended up winning the Eclipse Apprentice Award. Tell us a little bit about that. So my first year of racing um, in 1992, I was up for the Eclipse Award against Jesus Bracho, and it was a tight race, you know, and um, I really, I really wasn't thinking about it a lot because I was so focused on just winning races and my mom was all excited, you know, about it. And the night that they announced it, that Jesus Bracho won the Eclipse Award, you know, it was a little defeating, but I was like, you know what, I'm really grateful for the career that I've had the opportunity that to even be up for such an award in horse racing. Mm -hmm. So come to find out, I, what was it? Two, three years later, um, he had cheated. So I was put up to win the eclipse award being the first woman in racing history to ever win it. Not only are you the first woman in racing history to ever win it, you might be the first jockey or woman in history of horse racing and fitness to <laughs> win a fitness award. What was that all about? So I had retired uh, horse racing in September of 2015. Um, I had gotten my cert, I got certified as a personal trainer and uh, got a nutrition coach. And I moved to Texas and I was just going to the gym every day. And my, I had hired a personal trainer actually to train me because I just wanted to really get in tip top shape again. Like it, I was in racing. And he recommended, he's like, oh, you should compete. And I was like, compete for what? You know, he's like, for fitness. And I was like, oh, no, because in my head, I was thinking those big bodybuilder women. Mm. And I was like, no, I don't want to look like that, you know. And he said, no, 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 you would do like bikini fitness. And so I started doing that. And it was such a great experience, um, you know, going into my first uh, competition. It was two months of learning how to pose. Um, building, you know, and then really working out religiously hard meal prepping and planning. And, um, it was a lot, but I really loved it because it was a really big challenge for me. And my first, uh, competition in bikini fitness, I won. Oh, nice. Fantastic. <laughs> Just go, always good to That's why I said it's, you're probably the one, only one to have that daily double for sure. Yeah. I would imagine. <laughs> So you mentioned that, so you got into that and then it seems to me that maybe you really liked that a lot because afterwards 
you became certified as a uh, um, personal trainer and as like a nutritionist, right? Yeah, I, I'm certified as a sports nutrition coach. So that's actually my passion is nutrition. So I have, um, I've had about uh, 20 clients so far that I teach how to eat uh, mm. specifically for their body type. So it's not like a one size fits all. It's just, you know, body awareness, learning about foods, why certain foods work for you and why certain foods don't, you know, so that has been a big um, highlight in my life because I really love that aspect of it. And I love studying about food and nutrition. And also um, I'm doing real estate. I've been a realtor since 2003. I was actually doing it way back when as I was racing, I was selling trainers houses. <laughs> oh, nice. So coming to Texas, um, I reactivated my real estate license here. So I've been doing real estate. I'm a mobile notary. I do title work and also I do the guided nutrition coaching. So Ooh. I'm pretty active. Pretty There's busy. only 24 hours in a day. How do you handle all that? And, I am, and you're I sitting am in a parking go. lot right now because your daughter's doing gymnastics. So, I mean, when, yes. and where do you get 24 hours? You know, do you what? sleep? I do. I sleep very well because it's all in my wellness plan. <laughs> uh, have to be to bed early, but I still get up at four o'clock in the morning every morning. Mm. So that's you, a habit, you know, from racing. But for me, it's I'm my most focused in the morning. I like to work out in the morning and I just it sets up my whole day. It sounds like it. Now, you had mentioned that your parents were big fans. But there was also somebody a little bit deeper than that that were some big fans. And it was one of your signatures when you would win a race was a – who was that for? <laughs> my grandma, my grandparents, my especially my grandfather. His name was Frank Sanji. He was my biggest fan, my biggest supporter, next to my mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I – when I was racing in New Jersey, my grandparents came to the races every day that I rode. It would be at Monmouth Park, may it be Meadowlands, because they lived in Lyndhurst, so they were about 10 minutes from the Meadowlands. If I rode in Garden State, they would sometimes go down to Garden State and watch me race. But wherever I rode, my grandfather always had the TV on, always recording. You know, and after the races, I would always call them because they would be so excited. And he would tell me exactly how I rode every race, you know. And so when I would ride out of New Jersey, like if I went back to Florida, um, I told him, I said, you know, every time I win a race, I'm going to blow a kiss to the camera. So you know that I know that you're watching me. Mm. And to this day, well, before I retired, they had both passed away. And then I would start blowing a kiss up to the sky because I just, I miss them so much. You know, they were a big, very big part of my life. That was my mother's parents. So it was, you know, it was very important. Yeah, I could tell by the way you lit up, it was important to you when we asked yeah. the question. <laughs> Rosemary, so the first thing I got to clarify is I've brought some jockeys out of retirement. So some people were asking if I was going to bring you out of retirement. And I'm pretty sure I'm not, but I'll just clarify that right away. <laughs> no, I love my life. I am um, I go to a really amazing church that I've met amazing friends um, here in Texas. And my, the most important thing to me, the reason, one of the main reasons I retired from racing is because I wanted to be there as soon as my daughter started school to be able to be involved in all of her activities, school activities and gymnastics, you know, and she is my world, my everything. She's my best friend. She's my little mini me and we do everything together. So I'm so blessed and grateful for that because I had prayed about that for so many years, you know, just retire racing safely and be able to um, be that mom that my daughter would need. What is something you miss about being a jockey? And what is something that you think about now that you're like, oh, I'm glad I'm done with that part of it? Can I guess what I can, can I guess the, the, yes. the dieting? The dieting is what you're glad to be done with, right? No, actually, when oh, I was racing... Darn. I could eat anything I wanted. I mean, my weight was perfect, you know, and um, the thing that I don't miss about racing is moving every three to four months to a different mm -hmm. track, to a different state. You know, it was, you know, packing up, working, I mean, um, looking for an apartment, you know, unpacking. And it was just, it, it was tiring, you know. Um, one thing that I do miss 
I miss, I really miss the horses. I miss the competition, the, just the go, go, go all the time. And I really miss the racing fans because they just made it so much fun. And it was so exciting because, you know, win or lose, you know, when you have real racing fans that are yours, they love you no matter what, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, mm -hmm. Rosie, don't worry about it. You'll get them next time. And, you know, and just all the owners and trainers that I met throughout my career, all the states and tracks that I rode at. I mean, I've just met so many people and um, it was just an amazing and it was an awesome experience. And also for my daughter to experience my racing career, you know, she was still, she was about four or five. I think she was, I was going, she was going into kindergarten. So I think she was like five going to be six, but she still remembers, you know, and that was, that's important to me too. But yeah, those are things that I really miss about racing. Did you have one or two like favorite horses that you had a unique relationship with that were like your most favorite to ride? Um, you know what? There were so many that I loved, you know, um, I'd have to say Supa Blitz because that horse got me to ride in the Kentucky Derby. Mm -hmm. Um, Cloudy's Night riding in the Breeders Cup and just so many. I mean, there's so many horses. I rode probably, I think I rode over 14,000 races. So there was a lot of horses that I loved and, but every horse I rode, I rode them like they were my own. You know, I just gave the horse as much confidence as I could you know, before the race, even after the race, win or lose, I patted them. I always made sure they knew that they did a good job. Do you keep up with horse racing now at all? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Some right. people, they ask me, oh, what do you think about who's going to win the Kentucky Derby or the Breeders' Cup? And I'm like, I don't know. Just tell them they I, watch our show. We'll tell them what to do. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to start watching your show. I'm really happy that you guys contacted me. You know, it's um, when Willie Martinez, he sent me a message, you know, telling me about it. I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, I'd love to. And, and I, and I do miss watching the races, you know, but where I am, it, there's, they have uh, Sam Houston here racetrack, mm -hmm. but it's about 45 minutes away. So I'm really not close. And the people that I know here, nobody knows anything about horse racing. So, <laughs> well, I will say one one thing to be proud of is you were one of the most influential female riders and there are a lot of female riders right now that are kicking butt and uh are just a great a lot of young ones coming up yeah, yeah they're yeah. tearing it up uh -huh, for sure and i love that because you know what i was all about girl power i always supported them i wanted to be like the best mentor that i could because you know racing is tough i mean it's still the sport of kings you know, and it's very, very male dominant, but women have really paved the way and made a lot of, um, opened a lot of doors, especially a lot of women trainers that have really taken off. And, you know, even before I retired, I noticed that and I thought that was amazing. And, you know, I have, um, like, I will catch glimpses of some of the girl jockeys that are racing now. And I am like, so proud of them because it takes a lot of determination and it's a mental and physical game you know mm -hmm. you have to be all in you can't just be like oh I, i'll ride good today no it's like focus you have to be focused every second you know especially when you're in a race if you're not paying attention you're gonna get dropped mm -hmm. you know and you just have to be totally aware and focus that entire from start to finish gate to wire so simone gate to wire <laughs> simone uh Chatelain, simone i hope i got my daughter's name simone so it's just the most awesome girl's name ever <laughs> thanks to rosemary of course but what were your greatest races in your opinion so simone Chatelain is one of my dearest and best friends here so i Texas. did get the last name right good <laughs> yes you did uh -huh. um one of my what was her question again she says to what were your greatest races in your opinion Riding in the Kentucky Derby was a huge experience and the Breeders' Cup. Um, I think because it was the most publicized, there were so many people. When I, I remember riding in the Kentucky Derby in 2003, I was there five days prior to the race. And I call it my Kentucky Derby diet <laughs> because I did, and this is not an exaggeration. I mean, we have it in writing, like notes and everything. I had a friend of mine come with me and she was basically like my, my publicist and she was my best friend, but she just was really good at it. I probably did about 350, um, phone interviews 
I think I did 150 radio interviews. I was on all the news stations, the ESPN, even had my name scrolled across ESPN, Mm. you know, so it was really, I think the Kentucky Derby was my most exciting race. Until tonight. Until tonight. (laughs) That's absolutely (laughs) for sure. Now your daughter's off to the side there in doing gymnastics. When you were younger, I know your mom would pray that you would become a jockey and eh, maybe it wasn't your thing at first. So you were a cheerleader. You were in track. What did you do in track? I did the hurdles. Ah, were you fast? Um, I was okay. I wasn't the best, mm. but um, I had good. Uh, I had good other runners with me. So uh, yeah, they picked up the pace. So then uh, you went off to college for a year. Then you came back to work on a farm. You're like, wait a minute, these horses go really fast. So your daughter now is not really doesn't sound like she's too into horse racing, but. If she came to you down the line and said, you know, mom, I'm thinking about being a jockey. How would you feel about that? I would support her in anything that she did because she's as she's very competitive. And one thing about her and all my friends here know it. It takes her no longer than two minutes to learn something new. And she just excels at it like quick, mm. you know, just like a hoverboard. I got her a hoverboard a couple of years ago. Within 30 seconds, she just like took off. I'm like, I still fall off that thing. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no. I mean, her balance is incredible. Um, when I put her on a horse, I mean, she just had that natural balance just to go, you know. Um, but right now, like for her, my daughter's passion is sharks. She yeah. loves everything sharks, the ocean. She could tell you how big their teeth are. She could tell you every name of all the different sharks. So that's kind of her passion right now now she's gonna be deep sea diver see jordan park says it's my recollection that you used to ride at atlantic city racetrack and garden state park but you had mentioned that your grandparents were in jersey so how did you like those tracks are both closed now right what yes. did you like about those tracks so well i loved atlantic city not the night racing <laughs> mm. but i loved riding atlantic city because i was riding mammoth park during the day and i always got like the the cheap horses from Monmouth Park were like the stake horses in Atlantic City. <laughs> so every time I went down to Atlantic City, I would win two or three races a night. So mm. it just made the trip awesome and um, worthwhile because it was an hour and 15 minutes to get down there. And by the time you got done, I wouldn't get back to New Jersey till about 1 2 o'clock in the morning. And I have to be at the track by 4.30. No, there's not, not a lot of sleep then for sure. No. So we're getting a lot of questions here. Did you get emotional during the Derby post parade? Says Liz Gooch. You know, Liz, it was, I was number one horse. So I came out of the tunnel first and you could just feel the energy of the crowd. And when the music started, I remember like looking all the way up to the top. I mean, in Kentucky, remember the seats were super high. And I would just look around and everybody was singing and you can't help but not get emotional, you know, but I was like emotional, but I was excited. Like, I can't believe I'm here. This is awesome. Mm. You know, so it was a, an amazing experience. Did you, did you join in the chorus of singing at all to kind of get out of the moment for a minute and relax? Or are you just thinking about uh, what you had to do? No, because I wanted to really stay focused on what was, you know, the race and I, I was consistently paying attention to how my horse felt, you know, making sure that, you know, he was good. He was happy. And honestly, he was so chill in the post parade. I was like, come on, wake up, wake up. <laughs> but I know how he was. He was just like the coolest horse. You know, he was very easygoing. So um, even when we broke out of the gate, he broke fast, you know, because mm. in Kentucky, that one hole, when you come out of the one hole, you have to kind of curve this way to not hit the rail, you know, cause it really, it's like dead in front of you. So he broke real fast and he curved around and I was able to get in good position mm. right away. It sounds like a lot of this, something, unfortunately, Sean and I will never get to experience that. <laughs> no. I rode a horse once and that was enough for me. So we have another question from Timothy Murray he says, uh, which other female riders do you admire today? Uh, well, today I'm not sure their names, uh, Rosie Napravnik. She's retired mm-hmm. now, but she was amazing rider. She really um, opened a lot of doors for women, too, that showed that, hey, you know, you put in the hard work, you're going to succeed, you know, and she did an amazing. Um, 
at the top of my head, I really can't remember. Um, there was a lot of female riders that I admired and, um, got to start with mom. Oh, my mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so my mom, my mom, she like her passion. I mean, she loved to this day. She's still training horses. Like she loves it. I mean, you talk about horses, she, her whole face lights up. She just gets excited and, you know, and, um, when she was racing, I mean, it was a lot harder for her at that time because still women hadn't really broke into racing as much as it is now. So, but her claim to fame and her only win was on a horse named, uh, winning news. Mm. And she, I have the picture actually. I think she has a copy. Cause I'm like, I want that picture. <laughs> Keeps it and, for sure. Yeah. And, um, she was telling me about that race that she, when she came down the stretch, she was head and head with another rider and she cursed him out the entire last quarter of a mile <laughs> and she beat him by a nose at the wire. And uh, a trainer that she was working for, Larry Geiger, he she told him what she did. And he was like, you can't do that. You know? <laughs> did you ever curse anybody out coming down the lane? Uh, not well, unless. Yeah, not like that. Just, <laughs> you know, if you're bumping and you're, you know, trying to get through or someone shutting you off, there's a little bad language that goes on in racing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can imagine that unquestionably for sure. Sean, uh, anything else tonight? Well, I was actually going to add. So I know there wasn't as many female riders as there are now, but was it one of those automatic bonds? Was there ever a rivalry between female jockeys if you were at the same track or was there that just that automatic bond that you guys stuck together? No, it was, it was competitive, you know, no matter if it was with male rider or female jockey, it was always competitive because we all want to win. You know, and it's, you know, and there's a little bit of jealousy because like, oh, how could she get that horse? And why couldn't I get that horse? Or, you know, it, it's just the nature of the game. It's competitive. Mm -hmm. And know, what about there's usually only one winner and it's really hard. It's really easy to lose, but really hard to win. What about, I ask jockeys this a lot. Rich and I disagree on this. How much of it is the jockey and how much of it is the horse? I say 90% horse. I say more jockey, but. Well, you can't pick them up and carry them. <laughs> but, I win. You know, uh -huh. <laughs> but it is, um, you have to be smart. You know, you're the one in control of that horse. When that horse leaves the gate, if you need to be in front, you got to hustle them out of the gate. You got to get them in position right away. I mean, if it's a, like a lazy horse and you got to, you know, get them out of the gate, get them in position. I mean, you have to um, make that horse move. You got to make him or her get into the race get in the position that you need to be in and you got to pace the horse. You know, there's some horses, they, sometimes people are cursing riders because the horse is running off. You know, the rider knows that, but maybe the person watching is like, why are they going so fast? You know, but the more you pull on that horse's <laughs> mouth, the faster they're going to go. You know, when a horse is running off, it's, you know, it takes a lot of finesse and sometimes you can get them to drop the bit and, you know, come back to you and slow down. But other times you can't, you know, and it feels like you're pulling on a wall, mm, you imagine. know, and let me tell you the forearms, when you hit that wire, you can't even, your hands are just like this when you have a tough horse like that, you know, so jockeys, they, every rider, every jockey that is out there, they work so hard. You can't imagine. I mean, it's, it's a hustle when you're out mm -hmm. there, you have to hustle for business you have to create a good reputation for yourself, you know, and you have to show that you're determined and you're there to win because this is an expensive game for owners and trainers. You know, they don't want to just put some ride on like, oh, I'm so happy to be here. You know, mm. uh, you're on my $45,000 horse, you know, <laughs> you better uh, pick up the reins and win on this horse. You know, you got to be focused. I mean, so every jockey that's out there, you know, on top of everything, we're risking our lives. You know, the horses break down, horses jump fences. I mean, I've had uh, my first career here because my daughter now. Um, when I was my first year in racing, um, I was at the Meadowlands. This is in 1992. And I was coming down the last quarter of a mile on the turf. And my horse's name was Toymaker uh, for Phil Serpy. And I was, I was in front by seven lengths. And it was night racing at the Meadowlands and the lights used to be on the top of the building, not like around the track like they are now. And I was hitting left-handed. I switched sticks and I went up 
like this and I went to hit and she saw like the whip cross, I guess the flash of her eye and she jumped the fence going about 30 miles an hour. We took the fence down for about a 16th of a mile and the pole, the tripod punctured through my hip and it shattered my iliac crest on my hip and punctured the horse in the neck, which it didn't kill her. She's fine. I ended up riding her a year later. <laughs> mm. um, but yeah, that you, you just never know. You know, you could be uh, leaving the starting gate. This arm, I broke it twice. I have a plate with six screws. Horse broke out of the gate. Uh, two strides out of the gate just fell to her face, flipped over. And I landed and I was laying like this. And she jumped up and she didn't mean to, but she was trying not to step on me. She ended up kicking me in the arm and shattered my arm. So oh, lots of unfortunate I mean, fun, huh? Yeah. You know, there's so many things that can happen. So not only being a good rider, smart, doing the weight, you got to be fearless, mm. you know? And your daughter's name is Victoria, right? Hi, Victoria. Yes. How are Hi, you? Victoria. We see you back there. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Yeah. Nice smile, too. Uh, one last question. We'll let you roll here quickly. Uh, Dolly Dune says, thank you for being so inspiring to all your friends here in Texas. There's like another one. You're amazing with your positivity. What would what would be your best advice for anyone thinking of becoming a jockey? So Dolly Dunn is my soul sister, my best friend, like my world here in Texas. Like she is. She actually is somebody that brought me to the church that I'm in right now and has just brought me on an amazing godly path. And I just adore her. And she's like, we're so close. She's in my will, mm. <laughs> you know, and she, her and her husband, Matt, they're just such good people. And they're right. Matt and Dolly. Yeah. <laughs> we love them. So my Dolly, um, if somebody was another female rider would like to get started into racing um, advice that I would give them is you want to start from the ground up because when you start from the ground up, you're going to appreciate more of racing um, of the wins. You know, if you're just kind of thrown in and you start winning right away, you're just like, Oh, this is easy, you know, and the wins don't, I think the harder you, it takes for you to learn and get there and learn the right way and to appreciate the horses, appreciate the game, appreciate the owners that put so much money into it. The trainers and the grooms that are there 24 seven, like watching these horses train and taking care of them when they're doing good, when they're doing bad, you know, doing all the legwork, you know, as a jockey for me, I appreciated every moment, like everything, you know, I would go to the barns and just, you know, I would appreciate the trainers for even giving me an opportunity to put me on such amazing horses, expensive horses, you know, and trusting me to ride their horses to get them to the wire first. So there's a lot that goes into racing and it, it really is a mental game. You want to make sure that you're, um, again, you are totally focused. You are in, in it to win it, but you're in it to, um, you're a hundred percent there. You know, mm. it's not, Oh, let me do this over here. Oh, I got a ride today. Let me just hurry up and ride and let, let me leave. Because a lot of people have their, you know, their livelihood is there, you know, and as a jockey, when, when I was a rider, that was my livelihood. That was my everything, you know, to be there and always to get better, you know, in racing, you're consistently learning about horses. Every horse changes. You can ride the same horse over and over and they're going to, they're going to be quirky and they're going to do, they're going to not run the same exact race every time. You know, if it's a speed horse, yeah, they're going to want to be in front all the time, but what if they stumble out of the gate? Then what, you know, you're not in front. So you have to re readjust your strategy at that point, you know? So it's just, a, it's a game that you're just like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And when I retired, <laughs> I am so go, 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 which my friends here will tell you, I'm still go, go, go. Um, when I stopped racing, it took me like three years. I'm like, why is everybody going so slow? You know, uh -huh. I was always like, come on, let's go. Let's do this. Let's do that. And they're like, Rose, you need to slow down. I said, no, you need to keep up. Let's go. You know? So it took a little time because I, I wasn't used to a slow paced, 
life, you know, 24 years as a jockey and just moving and going and, you know, riding these fast race horses. And, you know, it, it's just, you got no time to think. It's like, you think about winning and that's it, you know? So it, it was really an exciting career. And I, I actually do miss that. I miss that like excitement in that, you know, there is no feeling like winning a race. I will tell you that. I don't even care if you win the lottery. There is no feeling like winning a race. When you hit that well, wire I hope first, I can win the lottery too. So I can at least <laughs> somewhat experience what it's like. Right. But yeah, I'm telling sure. you, when you hit that wire first as a jockey, it is the most amazing experience that you will feel. I mean, you could ask any jockey that. And that's why we consistently stay there for years and years and years. You know, I could... I could go a month without riding. I mean, without winning, it would drive me insane. But because I know it's coming, it's coming. It's I'm going to, I'm going to win that race. You know, I'm going to get to the wire first. So it's, it's an addiction. Racing is an addiction. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, we're glad that you slowed down for a few minutes for us today and that the, <laughs> the technical difficulties were able to overcome. That was a big positive. So we appreciate your time. We appreciate your time, Victoria, as well. We hope you enjoyed your gymnastics sure. class. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you, indeed, for, for coming <laughs> and, and for sharing your mother with us this evening. Uh, any other final questions, Sean, before we before we roll? Um, we get, well, what was your, uh, since you did ride so many tracks, somebody commented, what was your favorite track to ride? I have to say Mammoth Park because it is absolutely beautiful racetrack. But I do have to say Calder Race Course, which is not there anymore. But Calder Race Course is where my career started, and the publicity department that the, the the publicity department there was just number one. Like they just they really helped me get my career off to a great start by promoting me and um, just doing so many awesome things. Like when I got to ride in the Kentucky Derby, they had made this huge um, poster picture frame of me, which I have hanging on my in my wall in my house. Um, and Mammoth Park, the same thing. They really um, welcomed me with open arms when I first got there. And gosh, that was in 1993. I got to Mammoth Park and I did really well there for a long time. Hmm. So I'm, I'm going to say those two racetracks were my most favorite. All right, Sean, any other questions, my man? No, <laughs> we, we were we no, 15 we... <laughs> minutes and we're yeah. 33 minutes in. Does it feel like it was 33 minutes, Rosemary? No, not at all. I can no. talk. <laughs> we keep good company. Well, yes, just indeed. keep the questions coming. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll let you get going for the evening. I'm sure you and Victoria have some things to do before you call it a night and get up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. From having. Yeah, I knew waking up at four o'clock wasn't going to be the answer. What she missed, since she still does that. Mm, I, yeah, that would be my mine. My friends think I'm crazy, but you know, they'll. <laughs> it's funny now. They'll ask me like. Hey Rose, can you text me at like five thirty? Because I want to get up early too, you know. And I'm like, are you sure? Because I'm gonna text you, and they do, you know, and they love it. Like me and my friend Dolly. I mean, I'll drop my daughter off at school. I go to her house. We do yoga. We do qigong, and then we'll go for like a power walk. And then she goes to do her thing, and I go do my thing. You know how celebrities have like those birthday calls? You should do wake up calls. <laughs> Hi, this is Rose hey, Mary. It's hey, time hey, to get up. Go. Let's go. Go, 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 go. Go, go, go. Indeed. All right. Well, I'm we thank you for your buddy. Yes. You need to start living the fit to fab lifestyle. That's all about your wellness. I live the fab with the T lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, hopefully we'll get back together again sometime soon. Absolutely. Have a great night, guys. Thank you. You thank as you. well. Bye bye. <laughs> Always fun, Sean, no? Absolutely. And that was, you know, we always tell folks that we're going to be on for 15, 20 minutes, and now we were at about 40, so. Yeah, uh, you know, I tell them, too, as long as they're okay with it and they keep going, if they if they say they have a time restriction, we'll make sure uh, we get them out of there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that I'll just keep on asking questions if I don't <laughs> stop myself. You know what? The compulsive maybe, question asker. Maybe it's just a time like when I started watching racing and stuff, but I always think Rosemary Highmonster Jr. and I think Tampa Bay Downs. That's what I always think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was awesome. That was a lot of fun, Robert. I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, it's uh, <clears throat> I'm not. I'm only kidding. I I I, I live the yeah, I live the fat lifestyle. It's all right. <laughs> I'm trying to get in shape right now. It makes me feel bad. Uh, in any case, um, getting back to the bag. You know, I did the you know the whole COVID thing right the first year. 
you either gain 20 or lost 20. So I lost to 20 the first year. And then the second year, I don't know, it twinged my knee. It's still kind of bulky. And then I, I put it all back on. Now I've taken it all back off again, and I'm going the other direction. I want to get back in my fighting weight, Sean, as they say, so that I can actually do that MMA thing that we've talked about before. Now, we've talked a lot about days that end and why. It's usually bad news about Bob, but this time looks like it's going to be some good news from the Bob Baffert story from the Medina spirit. It looks like they're passing some rules um, for a little bit more transparency in terms of the rulings down there with the Kentucky Horse Racing Board. So I, I guess from all bad things, maybe at least something good can come. Yeah, Transparency is always a good thing. Yeah, um, but then I read some parts of this article, and one part said as long as it doesn't affect the trial or anything. So, um, well, yeah, but those are your constitutional rights. Yeah, so I don't know how much we'll actually get out of it, but uh, any little bit more information we get and transparency, like you said, is better. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think they should always are on the right of on, on the side of protecting people's rights, Sean. I mean, I grew up in that era. Like when we went to school, we learned about the Constitution, <laughs> what it meant, to, you know, all these things, and why these rules and why these rights were important. And then sometimes I feel like maybe a little bit of that is missing nowadays. Unfortunately, that race, though, seems to be cursed because not only did we have all the Bob Baffert, the Medina Spirit stuff, but uh, today we learned, unfortunately, that another horse in that race, Midnight Bourbon, died in his Churchill Downs barn. That's a sad way to start today. That's kind of how Terry and I started the show today, which was sad news, a kind of a little bit of a bummer uh, to start today. What did you feel like when you heard about this news? Yeah, and then I read, and I was actually in the middle of texting you about it, and I went to say just died, and then I read that he died on Sunday, so it's odd to me that it came out so late. Mm. Um, and like some people question on socials and stuff, if this was Bob Bafford, we would have heard about it Sunday night, you know. And everything would have been out. Um, people got to just st stop with that and just realize that we, you know, we lost another great horse um, way too soon. Um, and then I did see some pieces on breeding, and I weren't. I know you're not really into breeding, and I'm not in. But Midnight Bourbon's one of the last in his bloodlines. Um, so there was a piece on that on socials that was really good too. Um, like I said, I'm not really into the breeding, but it was really a significant loss and another blow to the industry having such a talented, not even a talented horse, just a young racehorse in general. It was a talented um, horse. I feel like the one thing I felt about midnight bourbon is that it was always one that you knew you were going to get a, a, you know, a solid effort from gate to where the horse was going to try to win. And it didn't always win. The numbers were always there, but the horse just fought and fought and fought and fought. But unfortunately for it more often than not, there was one race or, I mean, one horse or maybe two in the race that were just slightly better. And had he caught a little bit lighter company along the way, he might have been, uh, you know, considered one of the better horses, right? Yeah, and Mike Smith rode him one time, and that was the Kentucky Derby last year. Um, he did give me, a, you know, a quote today, just so sad to hear. He was a great horse, always so sad when one passes like that. And he only had the opportunity to ride him once. He said, maybe Joel could tell me more. Yeah, uh, I'd love to get in contact with Joe Rosario, but I've been unfortunately that hasn't happened yet. He's been ghosting us. Yeah, but I guess he's been winning. He's been winning, he's been winning Eclipse Awards and not having the time for. Yeah, for, but you know what? Uh, I mean, it, want at all. What's Eclipse Award compared to being on Horse Center? <laughs> anyway, um, one final thing because it's been kind of a little on the long side today. Opening day tally at now the Horseshoe at Indianapolis. Of course, it was a record-setting day. This is the first day ever for Horseshoe Indianapolis, Sean. So I guess maybe some of the smaller tracks do all right, depending upon what do you think? Big fields, big possible payouts. Why do you think that a track like Indian Horseshoe Indianapolis can do very well on opening day? Maybe some other struggle. That I don't know. I mean, obviously, it was something new with the name, and they have different things going on first race of the... Um, I really don't know. And it really didn't top it that much by opening day last year. Um, no, but still year, topping it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I, if you count for inflation, it's probably inflation adjusted down. But honestly, do I, here. I've seen a lot of people go, what is Horseshoe Indianapolis? And they're kind of confused with the whole Indiana Grand thing. And um, so I'm not so sure how well that worked out marketing wise because it's got some people confused. Um, well, but, I had me confused all day today. Terry kept correcting me. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they do have bigger fields, and, I mean, that first day, they were all over the place. It was, what, three out of nine uh, races, the favorite one, but then it was a $100 winner. Like, the average payoff was, like, $28. So 
Yeah, I think that's the one thing about Indiana Grand now, aka Horseshoe. <laughs> Indianapolis has screwed it up again. Um, that's the one thing about that track is that bombs do come home there. And if you happen to be on the bomb, I had one today, Sean, man, where unfortunately I had the five horse in one of the races at 25 to one. I was hoping for it, I think, in the first leg of the late pick four, but ended up running second behind the big favorite. And we didn't cash out on that pick four anyway, because in the I don't know. One of the legs I had like three horses or two horses scratch. And that brings into that whole conversation we had before about, you know, what rule would you change for horse racing? And, you know, to be able to pick alternatives, uh, I would have had to pick about three alternatives in that leg. Yeah. You know, what's funny is by the time I got home from work and everything, I looked at all the prices and I saw all the bombs. I had like 20 bucks in my account. I went strictly against the favorite because there's no way the favorite's going to win their race. It hasn't been winning. And a favorite won easily. How many times do we talk about that? When you throw the favorite out, how easily they win, but when you need them, they're they're nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. um, and then it happened at another track. Well, right after that, I don't know if it was Mountaineer or whatever I was playing. Right after that, same thing. Throw this favorite and second favorite out. Let's go with bombs and second favorite. Rock Chalk City, baby. Yep. Like, like Kansas, Rock Chalk City. <laughs> if You know, it's one of those things, I don't know if you play against your own – own thoughts or if I should just text you and say, Hey, look, I don't have this favorite at all. He's don't wire the field. Put your, put your put bank your, account, put on your it. life, put your life savings on <laughs> yeah. it. Huh? Bring yeah. them from one to five to one to 20. Sounds like a there great idea. We're $100 bet alters the, the odds that much. All right, Sean, that takes us wire to wire. Do you have your tissue handy? Yes, I do. <laughs> it's Sean's but saddest day, but we will be back tomorrow night with Sarah L. Bodway. Hopefully I got that right. From uh, 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 outrun the odds, right? Horse racing nation, horse racing nation. But her her handle her on Twitter uh, is at outrun the odds. Yep, uh, at outrun the odds. Yes, so she'll join us tomorrow. We'll talk about the three big races over at Oaklawn Park this weekend. Ken Latruska repeat in the Apple Blossom. I've seen a lot of articles saying eh, it's gonna get beat. We'll see what the Tom, Sean, Terry, and myself, along with Sarah, think is going to happen in that race. I'm not quite sure what Tom and I are going to do for foreign Fridays just yet. I think he emailed me somewhere, but I can't find it. So Tom, if you're paying attention, please send it out to me. And then Terry and I will be back tomorrow. We will tackle Keeneland at 12 o'clock Eastern. So make sure you join us for that at horse center. Uh, and that wraps up the week. Terry and I will be back to clean up some stuff on Saturday. As far as the remaining stakes races on the Saturday card, as we start to really gear up towards the Kentucky Derby, Sean. Yeah, and uh, next week uh, for Horse Center on Monday, we have Harry Hernandez. Jockey's been tearing it up at Turf Paradise. He owns Turf Paradise, there. baby. And then we have Apprentice no, Rider. Before, wait, 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 wait. Before you move on, before I forget, Sean, bringing up Jockey Harry Hernandez because he is a jockey, and then Sean has put together a contest. So yes. Jockey Survivor, make sure you head on over to our social sites, uh, Facebook at Horse Race. The number two day down, you see that down there, and Twitter. Sean has all the details. We're going to give away some fantastic horse racing today gear. You can catch that if you go over to horseracingtoday.net. Click on the horse racing today dot, uh, HRT gear. We're going to give away a shirt. We're going to give away a hat. But we're going to create a very special one-of-a-kind shirt for the winner. And it's going to be something along about being in the Jockey Survivor inaugural champion. You will be the only person on the planet that has that shirt. So if you want an opportunity to win that shirt, head on over to our Facebook page again. Make sure you follow along with the rules. And then I think we're going to go live Saturday, right, Sean? Uh, yes, we're going to start Saturday. So you don't have to have your picks in Saturday by 11 a.m. And also I'm asking everybody, whoever wants to play, just message one of the pages, Facebook or Twitter, so we can – write your name down and uh, be ready for your picks. And if you want to be a smarter handicapper, please go over to horseracingtoday.net, kick on HRT gear, support the show by picking up a hat or a t-shirt or a sweatshirt. You'll look a lot better. You'll be a lot smarter. And then of course um, it'll help you win that contest. Maybe. What do you think, Sean? Yeah. And I did clarify one thing. I said we weren't eligible for the prizes, which you had to buy anyway. So we'll take care of that. But one thing we will do if rich wins or I win, we're definitely getting that shirt to say we're the champion. Well, I'm, I'm not even going to play, Sean, because it's not fair for amateurs to play with a pro. Anyway. <laughs> oh, you got to play. You got to put your pick out every day. You know, the thing is, I, I'm, I'll, 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 I will play, but I'm going to be the first one to be disqualified because I forgot. <laughs> no, I'll remind you. Right, I will remind you. 
then I will play. But speaking of Harry Hernandez for that jockey tournament, uh, Sean, that's a guy on like those Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, Thursdays when they're running down at Turf Paradise. You're going to want to circle that guy on one day because you know he's going to bring you to the next day. That guy wins a ton of races. All right. Tuesday's guest. I'm interrupting. Tuesday. Now, this is uh, going to be – I need you for the name, but Maclovio Enriquez. He is a apprentice jockey at uh, Charlestown and Laurel Park. Um, and then Wednesday, we have NBC reporter. She's always out on the horses on Kentucky Derby and stuff, Donna Brothers, uh, former jockey fun. as well. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we got a lot of fun stuff coming up. Yes, it'll be, and then of course the week before the Kentucky Derby will be loaded with some talent in terms of the folks that we'll be bringing to the show, and it'll culminate that Thursday night with Eddie Olchek from NBC and hockey fame. So I'm looking forward to all of yeah. that as well. That's a show that Rich may need a tissue. Rich has been looking forward to this for a while since we've started this show, even before that. I mean, way back one. in the day when I started horse racing today. <laughs> net, I was tweeting at Eddie Olchek, and he's a Chicago hockey guy, and he's a Chicago, and I'm a Chicagoan, loves horse racing, and he has the greatest saying. And I know he's, you know, he 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 took it from somebody else, but and I don't remember who the saying comes from. He says, "But a man should make a bet every day, just in case he's walking around lucky and doesn't know it." And there you go. Yeah, so that's advice to live by, Sean. Absolutely, one hundred percent for sure. All right. Any final thoughts before we go home on hump day and you uh, head off to your pillow to cry? <laughs> no, uh, another uh, fun show. Uh, watched her a lot of her career and uh, great jockey and find out tonight. She's a great person too. So it was another mm-hmm. fun show and looking forward to next week as well. Definitely Have enthusiastic, on. positive, and uh, you know, making sure that the people around her feel the same way. A person, I apparently who lifts everybody up around them. And that's how we should all try to be. All right, Sean, that's it for tonight until Terry and I come back tomorrow at noon Eastern. We hope that everybody's night and their morning until we meet again, ends up and our good friend. Good to hear from you again today. Jay Marcos winner circle. Absolutely. Have a great night, everybody. 